That's a good question. So this is slide number 29, but before we get to this, I just want to review a couple things and a few of the answers are kind of actually on here. Um, if I show you this, what kind of wave is it showing? Is this an S wave or a P wave? Raise your hand if you think it is a P wave. No takers. S wave? Good. Um, which wave is going to arrive first? Raise your hand if you think it is a P wave. Raise your hand if you think it is the S. Okay, good. What wave is going to be able to go through all of our layers? Raise your hand if you think it is the P wave. Raise your hand if you think it's the S. Good, some of you are following the crowd, and that's good, they've been steering you right. Um, which wave moves like this? Is it the P wave? Raise your hand for P wave. Raise your hand for S wave. Good, this is the P wave, so this is the compression wave. Right. This one that we did first, this was the transverse, the side to side, said it kind of looks like the letter S on its side. Because we said that the S waves all have something to do with the letter S, so they're slower. They get stopped at what layer? What can't they go through? Kevin? Good. Why? What's it made of or what state of matter, I guess? Liquid? Yeah, very nice. It gets stopped at the liquid. Great. So it's stopped at the liquid. And then from there, um, you know, it, it will kind of, we'll take a look at what happens to that. So good. Those are the major characteristics. And so this is talking about the primary waves. They can go through the crust, the mantle, and the core. Now look at this. This is way off. This is the outer core. What's wrong with it? What do we say is off a lot of times? Can they? Yeah, that red is way too big, okay? And then the orange is way too little, the mantle, because of that. But nonetheless, it can go through the mantle, it can go through the outer core, and it can go through the inner core. So it's able to go through all. Now watch what happens to the secondary waves. <clears throat> they are going to hit that liquid, and they are going to get refracted. They're going to get bent away and not be able to pass through. So there's going to be this area. Um, remember Bill Nye, he took his like coffee can and he put it for the core, and it's like the, the light rays could not pass through. Well, the S waves cannot pass through that liquid. They get stopped. Okay, so slide number 30 shows us that the outer core is going to be a liquid, and this is a little bit closer to the approximate um, percentages for those layers. And so it's going to stop the S wave. So over here, um, you can see that the green waves are our P waves and that the red lines represent our S waves. So when it hits the outer core, it has to bend and go away from it. It cannot go through it, right? And that is a huge deal and a huge characteristic of these waves. And so the inner core is going to be solid and it's the most dense and so um, some things are going to happen with density as well as these materials travel, uh, the waves travel through these different materials. Okay. Um, but the S waves can't even get to that inner core because it's surrounded by liquid which acts as a buffer and stops the S waves. The S waves get stopped at the outer core or the liquid. And so the speed that they travel and the pathways are going to be affected by the different layers because the different layers have different densities. Think of our layer as strong, right? As you go down, density increases. So densities are going to change, and then that means the speed that the wave can travel is going to change. And the waves can do something called refract, which is a bend, or reflect, which is a bounce as they enter into a new material. Yes? It's a weird question, but I, uh, I don't know if it's like, they're very dense. 
Um, there is not, there is a relationship between temperature and density, like the spacing between molecules, so that affects volume, um, but that isn't like the only thing. So remember the video yesterday where he said he made a mistake and he said it's, you know, like the temperature was so great because the density was so great? Um, that is true with gases. You can increase the pressure, and you, that has an effect on kind of, uh, and you can turn it into another state of matter if you condense the, the pressure by changing the volume. Um, so, I mean, I, I kind of get what you're saying. That's more of a hypothetical, I think. Um, you know, and maybe certain materials would do that, but not all. Right? That wouldn't be like a characteristic that you would normally expect. Um, these are two vocab words, refract and reflect. Obviously, you know a reflection, right? It's like a, it bounces back at you. Um, it's like an echo, basically, if you're talking about sound. Um, refract might be the one that you're not as familiar with. And we'll take a look at this. So a reflection is what happens when a wave hits a boundary between different materials. So when it hits a different layer, it's going to typically, um, it can bounce or change directions. This is actually how they were able to map the majority of, or the, the part of the ocean floor that they do have mapped. They use this process. So there's a ship and then it has like a little recorder, um, or excuse me, they have a source where they send out like a pulse, a vibration, and then they have, um, a receiver down here. So they send out the signal and then it bounces back to the hydrophone that receives it. And so when this happens, they know the speed that that, that, that that sound should travel in that water. So they have the speed and they have the time it took. So how long did it take to go there and come back? So the only variable um, out of this speed equation, which is distance divided by time, they have speed, and they have time, so they can solve that equation to determine the distance, right? So they're able to see, okay, this is 20 meters down, this is 30 meters down. So they're able to use that simple equation and calculate how deep it is, and then they kind of can plot that, and then they can see, okay, it's not very deep here, it's deep here. Oh, there's a big valley here, or there's a, you know, a, you know, a high park here. So they're able to see what the ocean floor looks like by doing this. And this is kind of how they were able to find differences in our layers as well. Um, send charges down that send those vibrations and they know the speed and they know the time so then they can calculate the distance. So that's why they know where that MOCO boundary is and where that mantle starts even though we've never been there. Um, <clears throat> so this is true with sound waves as well. And this is probably what we're most familiar with with an echo, right? Um, I know we have uh, like a shop barn area and then it's connected to our indoor arena. And so it's a big building. It's like 80 by 120. So total, it's like 200 feet long, um, even though it's kind of two separate buildings that are just connected. And like if you walk out of our house, um, sometimes like if it's still or like it, it's, I don't notice it always, but the other day I noticed, like I said something and there was like a little bit of an echo because you have all this big solid metal wall basically of the side of the barn and that sound just echoed back. So it doesn't always happen, but it made me think of what we were gonna talk about today. Um, so echoes um, are something we're probably the most familiar with with a reflection. <clears throat> and so in the earth, these seismic waves reflect at the different boundaries of our major layers. So this is one way that it kind of helps us understand what's going on beneath the layers when we can't actually get there. And then a refraction, this also happens um, as seismic waves travel through different materials and things speed up. Um, keep track of my time here. Okay. Um, so think about when you are in water, like if you're running in water, what happens? Like if you're just running on the beach and then you are running the same, you know, using the same force, but you start running into the water, what happens to your speed? Jason? It slows down. Slows way down, right? 
So as you go through that more dense water, which is much more dense than the air, it slows you down. Well, light rays do the same thing. Other waves react the same as, as light. So as the light wave is hitting the surface of the water, it slows way down and it looks like it bends the light. So that's why when you have a pencil in a glass of water, it looks like that pencil's broken. You pick that pencil up and it's fine. One normal straight piece, you put it in and it looks like it's snapped or two pieces. And it's because the water, or the, excuse me, the speed of the light is able to go really fast in the air, but then when it hits the water, it bends or refracts and slows way down. Um, I had a student, because this was a topic in fifth grade, I had a student in fifth grade tell me, so a refraction is kind of like a, a break, right? It, it breaks or bends it, like just like you get a fractured bone, the bone like got bent and broke, this is kind of like the light ray getting kind of bent, and so it looks like it's broken, right? So that always kind of stuck with me, I thought it was kind of a good example. Um, and so you experience these refractions when you see, here it says straw, but there's a showing that pencil. And so I think all of you have probably experienced that, even like if you're in the swimming pool and you put your hand in the water, and you only have like half of it, it almost looks like your hand is like shifted away from your arm if you just have it up to your wrist. Um, and it's all about speed. So the light can move quickly through a gas, but it gets bogged down and slows down in the density, um, or as the density of the water, you know, increases. Just like you experience if you try to run through water, right? It slows you down too. So this is true of our seismic waves also. Okay, so, Back to this picture, um, you can see the green P wave is hitting the outer core and it slows way down and it continues that until it goes through and then it reaches another density and it's less dense so it speeds back up. Okay, so you get the change in speed as the densities change and that's why it's not like a perfectly nice straight line as it goes through the layers. Um, same thing kind of happens, um, and we'll watch a video here in a couple of days that kind of explains why these lines kind of curve like that. Okay. Now, this is getting to a really important point. It says some areas of Earth do not receive seismic waves from earthquakes. Right? So you see this thing right here called a shadow zone. Right? There are no waves that will ever reach there. We'll talk about why that is. Um, this is one of your vocab terms, a shadow zone. And it all has to do with the waves that are able to get through and the speed that they're traveling. So it consistently will affect their, their pathway from the source um, of the earthquake. So if the source is here, all the way to the opposite side of the world. right? Um, this should be slide number 35. I want you to put a big star here. You might see this again, maybe like on a test. Okay. Put a big star on this slide because this is going to be an important one. So to orient yourself, always look at what's going on in a picture. So the P waves are represented with um, the black lines and the S waves are represented with the red lines. <coughs> This is where the earthquake originated from, right here. Um, we call that um, the epicenter if it's on the surface or the hypocenter if it's still in the lithosphere. I don't really care about that so much as that's where the earthquake starts, okay? Here's how you can remember or, or predict, I guess, where the shadow zones are gonna be. So if my head is where the earthquake started, if you think of putting your hands down here, and you can see my hands, it's pretty much where the shadow zone is showing here, all right? So if you think about this is the origin, this would be the shadow zone. And it doesn't matter if my head's here, right? If my arms are down here, this is where the shadow zone would be. So it's always in relation to where the earthquake originates, okay? And it just happens to be, if you're talking about 360 degrees of a circle, which the Earth is you know, basically a circular shape, it's 105 to 140 degrees.
from the epicenter. And so that is kind of a go-to, it's very predictable. Um, 105 to 40 here and 105 to 40 over here as well. All right, so you can see the P waves are able to get through the outer core. They're even able to go through the inner core. They come back out the outer core and then back out through the mantle. They are picked up at seismograph stations all along this area. And you can see, this would be like a reading from a seismograph station, only P waves. Here is showing nothing. It's in the shadow. The wave is not able to come through. So if you look at my hand, right, I'm creating a shadow behind it because my hand is blocking the light, all right? So it's just like how, because of the bending of the P waves and then the stopping of the S waves, it's making a shadow here where nothing can get through, just like my hand is creating a shadow um, by blocking the light and not letting it through on the board. It's that same kind of idea and that's how it actually got its name. All right, so if you look up here, a station here would be picking up the P waves and the S waves, okay? So shadow zones are locations on the Earth's surface where no waves can be detected. And it's the angular distance of 105 to 140 degrees, and that'd be on both sides of the epicenter. They do not receive any P waves, and obviously they're not receiving any S waves because they couldn't get through at all. But even though, like we would think, if we if these waves would travel, I'm trying to make this very shocking, if these waves would just travel straight, you should see them everywhere, right? They should go to all stations, no matter where they are. But the lines don't, or the waves don't travel straight. They change because of that density changes, and that's why we get this difference. Good. All right, we will go ahead and have to stop there and pick up here tomorrow. You are heading the third period.